Thanks very much, uh, Chairman. And can I wish uh, Professor Boyle the, the very best of luck in uh, the next phase of his uh, career. Uh, and ca can I ask him for a second maybe to put on his hat on the Climate Change Advisory Council? Uh, as you know, there is now going to be a, a statutory function provided for the, the Climate Change Advisory Council and the Climate Action uh, Amendment Bill, which will set out a five-year uh, carbon emission cap uh, for the country. And that has to be rubber-stamped, uh, sadly, just rubber-stamped uh, by the doll. And then you're going to have se sectoral caps put in place without any um, consultation with the Oireachtas whatsoever. Now, my concern is in relation to these sectoral caps is they are five-year caps. As you know, in terms of agriculture, you need a long lead-in time to bring about uh, change. And my concern is that when we hit 2025, when the Department of Transport and Department of Energy and so forth have kept their hands in their pockets, so to speak, that the uh, statisticians will then turn to agriculture and say, look, reduce stock numbers overnight uh, in order to try and achieve uh, our 2025 or our 2030 targets. And can you comment on the built-in incentive that is now being put in through primary legislation on other government departments to do as little as possible and let agriculture carry the can in the fourth or fifth year uh, of the implementation. If then come back to the, the broader uh, issues uh, and the issue of the structure that is there in terms of, of climate targets. As you know, the climate targets are designed by industrial countries to deal with the bulk of emissions coming from industry, cities, intensive agriculture. And in Ireland, where 37 percent of our population live in 96 percent of the man land mass in rural areas, where we've only two cities over 100,000 uh, population, our challenges and issues are very, very different than any other uh, EU country. And it's about managing our land use and our, our dispersed populations. Now, in that context, that inbuilt industrialised country bias uh, is being um, adapted here and enacted into legislation uh, which could actually detrimentally impact uh, on uh, the Irish economy. If you take, for example, uh, beef production, like we all accept that as a net exporter of beef, Ireland is the most efficient uh, producer within the European Union. Now, if you look at the current environmental targets as they are currently structured, uh, we will see the decimation of the Irish beef industry, which will be replaced with uh, beef that's coming from South America. If it's coming from the Amazon basin, it's 35 times more carbon intensive than is the situation uh, in Ireland. And that's before it's exported uh, into Europe. And yet that's okay from a climate calculation point of view but in terms of global warming, it's having a detrimental uh, impact uh, on that. And if you could comment on that. And related to that then is this issue uh, of um, biogenic methane. Uh, because I think uh, Deputy Ledden raised and highlighted the issue very well uh, earlier on. The difficulty is that the environmentalists are purely looking at the figures in relation to this rather than the source of this methane. And the methane that is coming from agriculture is part of a biological cycle. And as long as numbers are maintained, that biological cycle remains in equilibrium. Now, disappointingly, the Climate Action Bill, uh, while it pays lip service to uh, biogenic methane, it doesn't actually enshrine in law that it should be treated differently. I, may, I know, uh, Professor Boyle, you touched on it earlier on in your presentation about the approach that's being taken in New Zealand. And maybe if you could elaborate on the fact that in New Zealand, biogenic methane is treated in legislation very differently to other sources uh, of methane that are actually adding to uh, the uh, 
the global warming uh, issue. And based from your engagement uh, with the IPCC and with the scientific community feeding into that, and I know Ireland is very involved in this in terms of the agricultural sector, is it likely that we're going to see an approach from the IPCC that would look differently uh, at um, the sources of, of methane and not treat them the same as is being done presently, regardless of the source, which has a very different impact on uh, the global uh, impact in terms of, of global warming. And just finally then, like the grass-based systems that we have in Ireland, and you spoke to, about it, Professor Boyle, earlier on in terms of your, your own home place. Like if you have disadvantaged land types, you can't use them for tillage, you can't use them for growing uh, crops <coughs> to feed uh, the public directly. The only way that you can do that is use stock to convert it into human protein uh, that can then be used to feed our population. Uh, and in many parts of Ireland, that is the only way that you can actively cultivate that land to produce human protein. And yet, purely on okay. the mathematical calculations that are being done at the moment, and the reality is, whether you like it or not, what will happen in reality is, if there's an overall cap put on stock numbers in Ireland, dairy numbers will increase as the beef herd uh, hemorrhages in terms of numbers, and that is going to take a lot of beef production off marginal land, which will let that land go fallow, which is not good in terms of food production. It's definitely not good in terms of, of low emission uh, protein production to feed our global uh, population, uh, particularly when we're using grass-based uh, extensive agriculture with its low uh, emissions profile. And how do we deal with that contradiction that is there in terms of the environmental zealots and mathematicians on one side saying, these are the figures, we have to comply with these figures, rather than actually looking at what is best for our global environment, which is maintain and support small indigenous uh, farmers uh, in rural communities across the west and northwest of Ireland, rather than shutting them down in terms of large beef production in, subs in okay. South America or dairy production in other parts of the world. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Deputy Doctor. Um, um, Professor, if you can be brief, Professor Boyle, because I have to close now. We're over our two-hour slot, please. Uh, look, Chairman, I, uh, one, one comment to Deputy in response to David Doctor's points. Um, many of these questions, I assure you, I'll be in a better position to answer in a couple of months when I've left this role. Um, because they, they were uh, encroaching on policy issues um, for which I prefer not to not to comment on. Um, I would agree, of course, that... Uh, but but ju just, Jerry, you I know, have, I know, I know, it, Dennis you want to have a statutory role in terms of the climate change advisory. Oh, yeah. No, and I, I am, I will be, a, uh, I am next to this year interim member, but you will understand uh, that, um, you know, the deliberations of, of the Climate Council uh, you know, I, I have to maintain my fiduciary responsibility for that group as well. But I, I would uh, say this much, uh, despite what might be the outside perception, and it has been a challenge for me, I've been most impressed by how the Council have addressed agriculture. The Council in the last uh, two or three years were the, the, the first body in the country to identify the issue that you've underlined there of the uniqueness of biogenic methane and argued for a separate target for biogenic methane. And I've no reason to believe that notwithstanding your comments in respect of the current, uh, of, the, of the bill um, uh, that's on the, the uh, that's been discussed at the minute, um, that that emphasis on the uniqueness of biogenic methane will be maintained. And certainly it will be something that I'll be articulating. I don't disagree with you at all. We're in complete agreement in respect of the challenges on disadvantaged land. Uh, and I've been saying this for quite some time, there are no alternatives to production of, of human protein through, through livestock and uh, also to the maintenance of those landscapes uh, in such a way that uh, the rest of us can enjoy them for recreation purposes. Um, I don't necessarily agree with you, Dennis, but I mean, look, we could argue the point. Um, 
uh, you're presenting a very pessimistic scenario in a worst case situation where there was a significant additional reduction in suckers. Um, I would see that, as I said earlier, I think there's a strong future for suckling. I think it will be maintained in the traditional areas. I do accept that premium price is required for a premium product. There will be alternatives in dairy beef and so on. I mean, it's not that long ago since we managed uh, quite well in the country with substantially less suckler cows. So I don't necessarily think that it's going to have to be if that future were to unfold, unfold as pessimistic as, as you say. But sure, look, time will tell. Okay. 